when we go to a solid liquid interface and kind of zoom in, so we have usually first the metal that comes into contact with the aqueous solution. So this is what I'm looking here, but of course you can have other um, electrolytes. And because we have different surface cycles, there is a potential drop is whenever we bring two different interfaces together. And this potential drop is very important in determining the properties of the surface. And the surface will, of course, also or the interface will react to uh, screen this potential drop and basically get to the bulk solution. Because we're looking at the metal aqueous interface, so the metal has infinite screening and most of the potential drop is on the aqueous side. When we go to a semiconductor, water interface, it gets more complicated because there the screening also on the, there will be also a potential drop uh, or screening on the uh, semiconductor side. Um, and so the processes that may go on, I mean, there may be obviously oxide formation, which is very relevant in the context of corrosion, uh, but there the first point in any corrosion process is the dissolution of ions. There will be absorption of ions, there will be reactions like hydrogen or oxygen evolution reactions that are uh, interesting for various applications that are nowadays discussed. And this is what we would like to understand. So when you go to the microscopic level, it is mostly about making and breaking of bonds in chemical reactions. And uh, if we think about the methods that we have available, obviously artemisia calculations would be a method of choice because it gives us insight both into geometric structure and energetics, which we would achieve also with the Thomistic calculations, but we are also interested often in the electronic structure, and this is where DFT would be helpful. Of course, there are a lot of challenges, and probably one of the biggest is how do we translate this material's complexity into a representative atomistic structure? And this is something that we uh, face with all kinds of real materials, also at surfaces, often our DFT cells are limited in the size that we have. We have material systems that are extending from the bulk to the environment, and we have to see also how to couple these different things. When we are thinking about an electrochemical environment, the, we would like to describe the dependence on environmental conditions, which are typically pH and electrode potential. Temperature may play a role. And what I will focus on today is mostly how we deal with the electrode potential. So what we would like to describe is this here potential drop directly at the interface. Um, this would be the regime, which is more kind of an um, exponential decay, which would be the so-called diffuse layer. So this is not something we will look at here. And then eventually we go to the bulk electrolyte. So this is here what we would so I would like to talk first of all, how do we get charge into our DFT cells with periodic boundary conditions? This is the usual setup. Then I would like to present an example of the hydrogen platinum water interface and uh, discuss whether water is important. Is it just a spectator? Is it something that we have to consider or can we neglect? neglect? And then how we actually achieve potential control and look at uh, what is the interface. If I have time, I'll talk also a little bit about magnesium water interfaces, but since I talked some about it the previous time I was here, I put it just to the end, even though we have some new results there. So um, let us first look at what we would like to describe. So this is the system and um, how does this potential kind of uh, screening of the, or screening of the potential of the interface work? We just have a pristine surface. At first, we will have water molecules at the interface to reorient, to screen the potential, uh, to react to the potential drop. And this would give rise to the potential of zero charge. Now, if we change the potential, which is typically done in electrochemical experiments, because this is the control variable, then there will be a reaction, of course, on the side of the electrolyte. So there will be a redistribution of the ions, which will maybe absorb to the surface, some may be pushed away from the surface to react to the charge. And then if we continue to increase the potential, 
eventually just by absorption, the system can no longer screen these potential drops. So the next best thing it can do is to have uh, an iron close to the interface, therefore building up a dipole, which uh, has a higher screening pr uh, pr probability. And then at some point there will be reactions that will start going on in the surface. And so what will be the requirements that we will have to designing a reference electrode or describing the system is that we want to have something which will be able to capture what is happening at the interface and really this steep initial potential drop that we have because this is what will determine how the reactions are going on. <clears throat> but then on the other side, uh, what is going then in the kind of more mesoscopic continuum Something is something we would like to treat, for example, by the charge that we have here. So we need to have a, an electrified uh, electrode. The uh, reference electrode must donate and accept fractional charges, because if you think of an electrochemical system, you don't put, you put whole electrons, but of course you have bigger surface areas compared to what we have in DFT. And therefore, when you can translate it to our DFT cell, this will be fractional charges. And uh, the reference electrode should be able to work with the potentiostat, should have a small surface dipole and also be inert to surface reaction. So basically be a computational tool which allows you to potentiostat the system, but not really be a participant. Now, how do we go about it? If we look at the electronic structure of the system that we want to set up. So we have on one side the working electrode and on the other side, we would like to get a reference electrode. And so if they have two different Fermi energies, then there will be a charge transfer within the system. We will have on one side a positive, on the other a negative charge, and there will be a potential drop at the interface. So this is what we would like to describe. Of course, as you know, most uh, DFT codes have periodic boundary conditions. So I don't have just an isolated cell. I have uh, it, the, the cell is um, repeated in all three directions. And so if I have here a difference in the potential, I have, however, here to have exactly the same kind of potential as here, which would mean that in principle, I would have a different potential drop opposite in the opposite direction. But we know how to deal with this because the dipole correction has been around for a long time and it ensures that we have a flat band potential in a vacuum region. And uh, by the magnitude of the dipole correction, we can exactly know what is the potential drop. There is a second uh, problem because there is a mandatory condition for a constant Fermi energy throughout the cell. So at the end of our self-consistent cycle, if I have two metal electrodes, what will happen that I have one Fermi energy, but I have lost this potential drop. And so I haven't achieved anything. And uh, then we thought, okay, why not using semiconductor concepts? Because in semiconductor physics, uh, manipulating the Fermi energy is kind of the daily bread. And so we thought, okay, if we have a material with a gap on this side, then, for example, if we um, start with a P-type dope situation, we still will have a charge transfer, thereby uh, distributing the charge on the different electrodes, but we will retain the potential drop even at the end of our SCF calculation. Finding, however, such a semiconducting reference electrode was rather challenging because you know that in typical DFT calculation, the bandwidth of the semiconductors is underestimated. Furthermore, we need to have both the working and the reference electrode in the same cell, which means that we need to strain our reference electrode and the deformation potential typically reduces further the band gap. And uh, we tried various things and we were kind of getting a bit desperate and then York uh, Googled. <laughs> because we have certain requirements. So we need a material with a very large, large band grip, should have a small deformation potential and be inert in possible reaction with the solvent. And we found that, that neon has the largest band gap in nature, which is in reality something like 22 EV. And even with PDE, GGA, it is still 11 uh, EV, which is severely underestimated, but for our purposes is uh, working. 
It is also uh, aligned such that it straddles the valence and conduction band of water, and thereby we can use the whole band gap of water in order to vary the potential. It's similar to reactions, and uh, it basically doesn't have any deformation potential or hardly any dependence on the training the lattice because the band gap is um, atomic property and it is not depending on uh, different atoms between the lattice. And so our setup now for which, which we perform GFT calculation for electrified interfaces is that we have a working electrode, we have our neon counter electrode, we have a vacuum region where we can use the dipole correction in order to um, basically see what the potential drop is on the interface between the working electrode and water, which is sandwiched between the working electrode and the neon filter. And um, we can now also charge the cell. And uh, what we use there is uh, pseudo atoms. So pseudo atoms may not be familiar to all of you. These are atoms within which both the core and the valence electron charge is changed. And therefore we have a neutral object. But by having, for example, neon with 8.00 whatever one electrodes, this additional 0 0.01 electron will be transferred to the other side. So the neon retains the eight electron configuration. But because the core still has charge, we will have then a separation of charges. But again, the overall cell is neutral. And this has the advantage that we don't have, for example, a, a um, background charge in order to um, make the cell neutral. And we don't have to worry about any artifacts this may introduce. Additionally, by using these uh, pseudo atoms, we can vary the charges such that we arrive this fractional e electron charges on the working electrode. And uh, overall, so far, we found all the advantages in doing this. Um, the nice thing is also that you don't require really any changes to a DFT code, because most dipole corrections or pseudo potentials of is uh, present in a lot of DFT codes, and you can basically just straightforwardly apply this and do the charging. It works for both metallic and semiconducting electrodes. We've tried this out, and uh, we can have direct access both to the charge and to the bias. Um, now, the first example I'm going to show is where we don't directly um, put charge on the system, but in the way by the neon electrode, because I still need to tell you how we control the potential. So the first example is going more from the, let's say, surface science, if you want charts or computational side towards treating electrochemical systems, we can very easily control the coverage on the surface that we have and thereby look what the potential is. Well, in experiment, you'll go the other way around, you apply a certain potential and then look what the coverage is. And we looked at the hydrogen platinum electrode system because this is like the fruit fly of electrochemistry. There are a lot of experimental work and there is also a lot of theoretical work. And we have things to compare to, which is always good when you <laughs> want to learn something or develop a method. Uh, so what is shown here is cyclic voltammogram, which is one of the uh, I guess one of the predominant experiments that is used in electrochemistry. And uh, what you need to, or what is important in the context of what I'm discussing is that both um, the scan both in the forward and in the backward, sorry, forward and backward direction or other way around, it's symmetric. So we are talking about a thermodynamic situation. So kinetics don't play a role. And uh, one branch is related to the hydrogen absorption, the other is related to the hydrogen desorption. And at this point is where we start to see in experiment hydrogen evolution. I said the system has been studied a lot and also in this context of surface science or computational hydrogen electrode, but this kind of maximum coverage is not achieved here as I'll show you and it's also not quite clear why there is a maximum coverage or where does it come from. 
So we thought this is a good system to first of all look at with our method and try to understand about the water interface interactions. So what you see here is the work function plotted as a function of the coverage and first for vacuum, where we take, we align everything to the pristine platinum 111 surface and then basically look at the change as we increase the hydrogen coverage at the surface. And uh, not unexpected, we find a very good agreement between the DFT calculation and the experiment. And this is a situation that we have basically absorbates in the surface, which try to react to uh, screen the potential drop, which we have obviously also in um, surface science. Now, if we look at the experimental data plotted here, when we are in aqueous environment, you see that there is kind of a shift with respect to the data in vacuum. And there is this maximum coverage that is obtained. But if you see kind of the data look very similar from the slope to what we see in um, the vacuum. And indeed, if we simply shift the points, you see that they lie almost aligned with the vacuum situation. And so this would mean that water basically doesn't play a role, maybe except for shifting the potential. Um, but then why don't we get this maximum coverage in a surface science kind of calculation if only hydrogen is important? So maybe water just do something more. So let's, then we did DFT, performed DFT calculations in which we looked at the platinum water interface with different coverages of hydrogen at the platinum surface. And then look what is the potential change which we read out by the dipole collection. So if we go to just the pristine surface, we do see that we have the same potential drop which basically would correspond to the situation that the water will re reorientate to screen the uh, surface. Then as we start to put chart, uh, so hydrogens on the surface, then we have up to a certain point that the potential is screened and it follows the experimental situation. And you see that something is happening here and then we have a very different dependence. And actually, if we go to one monolayer coverage, we almost have recovered what we have from back here. Um, so this is what we have initially just screening. Then we start to put hydrogen here up to a certain point. And what happens afterwards that increasing the bias and just putting more hydrogen on the surface no longer helps to screen the potential drop. So what happens is that um, Ion goes in the solution. And what we this is also what we see in our MD calculation. So after a certain time, we see that there is a proton going in the solution and remains as a hydronium ion in the vicinity of the surface, at least for the duration of our DFT calculation. Um, we do see it also for this coverages, but the closer we get to this kind of transition regime, the more difficult it is to model. And so we can't run so far the DFT calculation or up medium D calculations we ran don't show yet within this regime, this uh, this option that we expect it to be there. So this is kind of the first step I would say towards a hydrogen revolution. Um, the nice thing is that we can now analyze our system and figure out what's going on. So we can decompose the electrode potential into various contributions which are related to the hydrogen absorption or to the water, uh, or to the water at and close to the interface. So first of all, if we have hydrogen absorbed on the surface, it will have exchange of electrons or charge with the surface. And this is also something that we have in surface science. And this is here the orange curve. So if I take this orange curve and simply put it within my diagram, we see that this, um, data that we have extracted from the solid liquid interface, but considering just the hydrogen coverage uh, or the hydrogen surface interactions very closely follows what we have for vacuum. Now there are two additional contributions which are related to the water. And one is for water that is absorbed on the surface and that exchanges electrons with the surface. 
and the other is for water molecules that are in the vicinity of the surface and tree orient in order to screen the type. And these are these two contributions. Now, if you look up to maybe half a monolayer, we see that they are kind of have a similar but opposite slope. And um, later on, this changes. And what one can assume is that here, the discontributions basically cancel, but give rise to a shift. So the dominant contribution towards the dependence of the work function of the coverage is coming really from the hydrogen absorption. What we also see that the dependence of the electrode potential change is dependent on the number of water molecules and it's kind of linear. And uh, as we decrease the number of water molecules on the surface, also this contribution, um, sorry, if we increase the hydrogen, uh, so a hydrogen coverage on the surface, we also see that the amount of water molecules at the surface, absorbed at the surface decreases. So within this regime, which is kind of like a phase transition, we are losing all these water molecules that are absorbed on the surface. And the, just by reorientation, we can no longer screen the potential drop. And so within this kind of higher coverage regime, we have a mixture of the contribution from the hydrogen and the water contributions. And um, there is kind of a competition so at low coverage, hydrogen absorption dominates the uh, work function or the electrode potential dependence of the surface at high coverage is the water impact dominates. And um, we also looked at the um, charge density of the chemistry of water and platinum and um, the kind of what we were also expecting that there is only a direct interaction and charge transfer between the water molecule and the platinum it is directly absorbed on. And then we were very astonished to see that there is more. So if we, sorry, if we look at this, this will be kind of if we are in a LCMO picture that will be, we have here the platinum D band, we have the water orbitals, and then we have one orbital filled, and the other is uh, kind of a lot, and then there will be just a charge transfer in this direction. And there is a formation of a bonding antibonding state that we will expect, for example, for a molecule substance. However, when we look at the charge, we figured out that there is positive charge force on the water on, on the platinum, it is absorbed on. And the negative charge, the electron is distributed around this complex of a platinum and water. So um, this would mean that. Uh, any water molecule that is absorbed on the surface needs a higher surface area. So we would not achieve a one monolayer coverage because simply the electron cannot be distributed. And as we start to increase the hydrogen coverage on the surface, it will compete to transfer charge to the platinum and therefore the water can no longer distribute kind of a charge and therefore the water molecules get pushed away. And so, we are basically pinning the Fermi energy level and uh, water becomes partially metallic. And so we have kind of a revised model for the absorption that we have not only a direct interaction between the oxygen and the platinum it is sitting on, but actually a, high, a higher amount of platinum atoms at the surface is um, participating in this bonding. Now, this gave us some insight. Oh, I should also mention that uh, when, well, it is very important for the electrode potential drop that we have the water explicitly in the calculation. When we looked at vibrational spectra and also the free energy, we actually saw that there is not or hardly any influence on the water. So you see here in blue is a vibrational density of states we have calculated for vacuum. And in orange is for um, the solid liquid interface and they pretty much agree. And uh, there also we see two peaks that are consistent with what is known in literature. And if we look at the spatial resolution of the vibrational spectrum, I'm showing here on one range. And then we see the upper panel is for uh, vacuum calculation where we have longer in the trajectory, so therefore we have kind of better statistics, but overall all the pictures are the same. So 
we would say that in this context, our astonishment, the presence of water is not really so important. Um, now, um, we can now, we use now uh, coverage dependence in order to look at uh, the electrode potential, but we do not control yet the electrode potential, which will be important, for example, in the context of reactions. And so how do we achieve potential control? So again, just to show you, we use the, uh, the pseudo atoms in order to achieve the charging, but we may have a control logic in order to adapt the charge depending on changes of the potential, for example, if a reaction happens. And um, in order to do so, we have an Apiniti potentiostat, and I should particularly mention Stefan Wippermann and Florian Deisenberg, who were instrumental in uh, developing this. So let us just take kind of a schematic a look at uh, how the, our system looks schematically. We have a capacitive system, so we have two electrodes with separated charges. And we have, however, a medium which is uh, has a dipole. So if this water molecule was to turn, then there will be, of course, a reaction by the, potentials, uh, by the potential. It will try to screen this. And the system would now like to keep a constant potential, so we'll we'll feed back. So there will be a redistribution of charge. And by restoring the potential, we are kind of losing the charge. Now we need to make sure that we return the, <laughs> the dissipated energy to the same kind of degrees of freedom where it was uh, dissipated. And this is done by the fluctuations in the system, um, similarly like a thermostat is in turn there. So we must consider both this kind of dissipative energy and also the um, potential fluctuations um, in order to be able to describe our system and not cool it. So if we only consider dissipations, we see that eventually we cool our system and we can produce something like a flying ice cube effect if we couple correctly the thermostat and the potentiostat, we are able to retain the temperature even by just using the potentiostat. And uh, this is similar kind of, one can make the analogy to a uh, thermostat. So there you also have an exchange of kinetic energy with a heat bar via thermostat. And it's important to consider the fluctuations in the temperature. So we know in IMD we don't have just one temperature, but we have on average a certain temperature. And it's exactly the same kind of analogy that we have here for the potential stuff. So we need to consider the fluctuate electrical the uh, fluctuations in the potential and on average we would like to have a certain potential. And this we can do by using the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And this is a stochastic differential equation, which when integrated using E2 calculus, which I admit I've never heard before because before Stefan mentioned it, one gets a comparatively simple form for the propagation of charge with the time. And um, the first <coughs> term is the, <coughs> is the one which governs the system when we are far from equilibrium, so which pushes the system towards the equilibrium. And once we are close to the targeted potential energy, then this kind of second fluctuation term gets, takes over and ensures that we keep the potential at the targeted potential. And um, all quantity are easily obtained with DFT and the electrode charge can be directly computed at each MD step. So we can, using the dipole correction, then we can see whether we need to adjust the charge in order to keep an average uh, constant potential. And uh, so far, this has been implemented in VASP and in MEMS, and I hope we have it then at some point also in the uh, generally distributed version of VASP. Um, now, having this potential control, we can now look at for example, water at interfaces and try to use um, potential starting in order to learn something about the dielectric properties of water. And we were very intrigued by them because there was an experiment um, by Fumagalli uh, in which they, actually, oh, yes, I have to reference, in which they um, take, you know, two surfaces and change the distance between them and have water sandwich between it. 
and they measure the static dielectric constant. We see that you need more than 100 nanometer in order to get the bulk value, and you have a, a significant drop at the, uh, in the dielectric constant when you go to smaller distances. And this, of course, is also relevant when you think about the systems that we have in ability calculations. So we wanted to see whether we can understand the strong reduction of the um, dielectric constant and also understand its origin. Um, so we took, so these are basically the geometries that we are considering. And then we determined potential start MD with it calculations. Um, and you see that we very nicely follow the experimental curve. Um, there is some offset because uh, obviously we don't have, these are probably some kind of chemical interactions which are not so important, but what is important that we capture the kind of trend. Now having this, we can um, focus on a certain point and simply look at what is going on there and look at the uh, profile that we have you know, if we go um, perpendicular to the interface. So here is our surface, here is the water, and this is here the inverse of the dielectric constants. And um, what is plotted here is the density of oxygen and hydrogen. What you can see that you have something which is reminiscent of Friedel oscillations that you will have in a metal, and only after uh, like whatever eight angst when you get to something that is kind of the bulk value uh, that you would expect. Um, so what we did is then to um, try to separate this in three different regions and make a kind of a surrogate model. So what we have here, there's obviously some kind of hydrophobic gap, which is basically a vacuum region. And then we have vacuum screen. Then we have here this interfacial water region, which is rather narrow, and uh, where we have this Friedel kind of oscillations. And then we have the bulk like water region. And so making this separation and doing a surrogate model, what we can do is to simply very fast by simply considering a system of capacitors with different uh, Screening capabilities that we can simply calculate all kind of different dif distances that we have. Um, and to represent fully uh, by a continuum surrogate model the fully, fully atomistic, uh, atomistic behavior. When we do this, you see that we, with our continuum model, which really has no information about the atomic structures of these different, different water layers we can completely reproduce what we have um, from our calculations and also what is in the experiment. And so uh, we need really to consider that there is this dielectric depth layer, interfacial water has different screening, and then at some point we get to bulk water. I think I'll have time, I'm getting faster than I thought to everything. I'll have time to talk about the magnesium water interface and dramatic polarization, which was very interesting for us because, um, well, it's a system that is important for all kinds of applications from a point of structural materials. Magnesium will be interesting because it's very lightweight. Uh, it is important for batteries. It's important for medical applications because it is not toxic, but it has a very major problem and this is the very low corrosion resistance of magnesium. So if you look at the galvanic series, you see that magnesium is kind of one of the most corrosive elements. Um, and there is a very interesting effect. So um, what you see here is a nautically polarized magnesium, which means that magnesium metal is made more positive. And there is a very violent hydrogen evolution reaction, which goes hand in hand with increased corrosion rate. So this, um, this is shown here. So these are the cathodic conditions where one would expect that hydrogen evolution reaction is occurring because it would consume electrons. At anodic conditions, it is not expected to be a dominant reaction. And so it's kind of often referred to an anomalous hydrogen evolution. This was first re uh, reported in 1866. 
1866, but up to now the atomistic mechanism really why it is happening is not understood. And so we thought this is a good application now for our thermopotentials that method. Now, what uh, you see here is first we do uh, no potential control conditions. We simply let the system evolve. And here we shown kind of the MD, a movie of the MD. And initially we see here dissociation of water hydrogen penetration. Uh, what is plotted here is the um, trajectory to the surface, a kind of it's a function of time and perpendicular to the surface. Normal, so here are the magnesium atoms, here is the water region, and we blend out all the trajectories that are, you know, just separating atoms or molecules which are not important or so interesting in the context of what we are looking at, and we only leave. Um, the ones tra uh, trajectories that are related to reactions. And what we see is that we do have water dissociation and we have OH absorbing to the surface. Um, some of the hydrogens penetrate into the slab, some stay on the surface. But what we can also reach is a maximum coverage of one third monolayer. And uh, this is also what one people have found from uh, thermodynamic studies. So we are very consistent. Now, what we can do now is to really apply a potential. And I have removed now here all the water molecules that are, you know, just there and left only the ones that are really participating in the reaction. And again, you see the same plot, but now you can see that there is much more going on. So apart from the dissociation of water to form OH and hydrogen and some protons which move to the other side, at some point, we really see the onset of hydrogen evolution. And then we can also look at how this reaction is going on, what's the mechanism. And um, so there is a hydrogen that's absorbed on the surface. So there is a number of OHs that are absorbed on the surface. There's a hydrogen on the surface. And then a water molecule approaches this hydrogen and basically grabs it. And you would also see that it is approaching with the hydrogen. So typically we think that, uh, you know, hydrogen in water is positively charged. You would expect the hydrogen on the surface to be also positively charged. So why do they come together? Um, so um, this is kind of the reaction. And it's reminiscent of the Hirovsky mechanism, which is the typical reaction considered for hydrogen evolution under uh, cathodic conditions, but it will require consumption of an electron. And we are at electron deficient conditions on the metal side of the surface. So therefore, trying to understand it, I think I have removed. So we looked actually at the charge density, which I probably have blended out. <laughs> and we see that this hydrogen that is in the surface is negatively charged. So you don't need an explicit electron transfer, but basically the hydrogen that is absorbed on the surface is negatively charged, which is probably due to the Magnesium having some, yeah, magnesium has some different uh, or two peculiar properties with a very big spill out density and also it's very polarizable. And so we believe that this contributes to the hydrogen being negatively charged and therefore it can participate in this reaction. And we don't have kind of an explicit transfer of the electron, but rather we have a charge redistribution from the absorbed hydrogen then to an OH um, that um, uh, is in solution. Um, what we can then also do is to start to look at uh, dissolution of the metal, which is, I mentioned, that's usually the first step in a corrosion process. And again, we see the same kind of situation that we have first dissociation of water and absorption of OH. But we also see that eventually we have a dissolution or a magnesium going into solution. Um, this is a kink magnesium atom. And there are various attempts that it makes so very fast. It gets kind of four or five water um, atoms around it, but only when kind of a water mole sorry, water molecule, when a water molecule sneaks below it, it kind of cannot go back. But it also remains for a longer time kind of connected where no H group to the um, surface. So it kind of has its solvation shell, but it's still attached. And um, 
So we are just preparing the manuscript. What are the mechanisms how this hydrogen is transferred to the water molecule in order for it to dissolve? But these are kind of a few snapshots from what is going on. And I think with this, I'm yeah finished. I hope I was able to show you what kind of advances we have made in electrochemical modeling. And it is worthwhile investing the time to develop these methods because they give us insights that we would have not been able to achieve otherwise. And um, we learned something about the dielectric profile of water close to the interface and that we have very different screening properties, which will be important, of course, also in the context of what we are seeing in terms of reactions. Um, I discussed uh, what is the origin of the maximum absorbate coverage of hydrogen and platinum and talked about the corrosion of magnesium under anodic conditions. Before finishing, I would really like to acknowledge the people with whom I collaborated. So Udafshan did all the work on platinum and also the development that we had on the setup of the cell and all potential um, setup. So Stefan and Florian were um, and Christoph were involved in the development of the thermopotensis pattern. They were really very important to doing this. So Florian did all the coding. And uh, also we did then together this water um, close to the interface. And of course, I won't finish without acknowledging Jörg Neugebauer for constant supporting great ideas. Uh, and I will be happy to take any questions that you may have.